at the very end of Acts chapter 6, New King James Version, the last verse says, And all who sat in the council, the Jewish council, looked steadfastly at him, being Stephen, as these other people, the what the synagogue of freedmen were making accusations against him, saying in verse 14, We've heard him say that Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. So they were making accusations against Stephen. Stephen, And it says, Looking steadfastly at him, they all who sat at the council saw his face as the face of an angel. And chapter 6 ends with that. So chapter 7 begins. Then the high priest said, Are these things so? Asking Stephen to defend himself. And he said, Brethren and fathers, listen. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran and said to him, Get out of your country and from your relatives and come to the land that I will show you. So he's established, Stephen is establishing the fact that he himself is a Jew and that he is not opposed to Jews. Uh, and he's going back to the beginning of our history of Abraham to make the point that he himself is a Jew, that he is a believer in the Jewish heritage, all the things, same things that they believed in. So this all should be very comforting to those who heard, uh, but at one point it drastically changes. Um, verse 4, Then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans, which is in modern-day Iraq between the Tigris and Euphrates, I believe, and dwelt in Haran, which I just looked on a map. That's in modern-day Syria, I believe. He just kind of went up between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers up to Haran in modern-day Syria, or close to it. And from there, when his father's was dead, when his father was dead, he moved him to this land in which you now dwell. That's Israel. And God gave him no inheritance in it, not even enough to set his foot on. But even when Abraham had no child, he promised to give it to him for a possession and to his descendants after him. So this is the faith of Abraham. Uh, this is the promise of God and the faith of Abraham. But God spoke in this way, that his descendants, that Abraham's descendants, would dwell in a foreign land. That's the reference to Egypt. And that they would bring them into bondage and oppress them 400 years. So I just did a little... Uh, glance at this 400 years and there are a few different verses one says 430 years one says 400 and um, so there's some things that you need to work out I guess to understand the 400 but I'm not interested in that right now in this video uh, because this is a pretty long chapter verse 7 and the nation to whom they will be in bondage I will judge said God that's Egypt and after that, they shall come out and serve me in this place. Talking about Israel, the land of promise to the Jews. Then he gave him the covenant of circumcision. Let's see what this note says. Okay, Genesis 21 is the probably a reference to the circumcision. And so Abraham begot Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. Now, I've always wondered what, what the deal is with the eighth day. It's Genesis 25. 21 to 26, if you want to go there. Uh, and I don't know what the significance is of that eighth day. Uh, I mean, circumcision is cutting away of useless flesh. Uh, so circumcision is a metaphor uh, a lot of times to talk about, you know, the circumcision of the heart. You know, so if you cut away your desires for worthless things, fleshly, earthly things, uh, then you're not living like a Christian. So whenever you focus on spiritual things, then you're not focused on earthly, fleshly things. That's like a circumcision. It's the metaphor. Uh, so at least circumcision has that meaning. It is not focused on earthly, physical, fleshly things, but focused on spiritual things. And the cutting away or the removal of worthless 
uh, flesh. Okay, that's enough on that. Let's see. And Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot the twelve patriarchs. So, again, Stephen is just telling them what they want to hear now. He just, Stephen is just confirming the historical record of the Jews. And the patriarchs, become, becoming envious, sold Joseph into Egypt. And they, they wouldn't deny that either. I'm sure they agreed to that. But that's one uh, evidence of Jews rejecting their own kind that God had sent for a purpose. There's multiple occasions of that. So jo Joseph was sold into Egypt, but God was with him and delivered him out of all his troubles and gave him favor and wisdom in the presence of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. So Stephen is telling a lot of detail, but he's also skipping a lot of detail. You know, this if this is all you read about uh, Joseph, then you'd think that he had no trouble at all. But he had a lot of trouble with his brothers, his father and mother. Uh, and then when he was sold, he was thrown in prison for many years. Not just a short time, but for many years. And even forgotten about in prison uh, before he came out and, and rose to power. Or was granted authority in the kingdom now a famine and great trouble came over all the land of egypt and canaan so egypt is where joseph was staying and canaan was where his brothers and father and mother were staying and our fathers found no sustenance and he's stephen is calling our fathers uh the other 11 uh patriarchs the sons of jacob but when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. And the second time, Joseph was made known to his brothers, and Joseph's family became known to Pharaoh. Then Joseph sent and called his father. Well, let's see. So there you go, Genesis 45. That's where you can go get a few more details. Uh, Genesis 42. That's where you can get a few more details on the on the Jacob story and Joseph. Verse 14, Then Joseph sent and called his father Jacob and all his relatives to him, 75 people. So 75 people traveled with Jacob down to Egypt. Uh, they were starving, I guess. What else were they going to do? That's where the food was. And that's where... <laughs> Uh, Joseph was actually requesting that the family show up. So Jacob went down to Egypt and he died, he and our fathers. And they were carried back to Shechem and laid in a tomb that Abraham bought for a sum of money from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem. Now, it would be interesting to look up the location of Shechem and find the actual, see what I guess archaeology is found on the tombs of uh, Jacob's son, Jacob's Jacob and Jacob's sons. Uh, I may do that sometime, but I haven't done it recently. I may have done it before. Verse 17. But when the time of the promise drew near, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt till another king arose who did not know Joseph. So as long as Joseph was there, Joseph held high authority in the Egyptian kingdom because he actually prolonged their life and showed great wisdom and godliness and uh, protection from God for the whole country. But a new, another king comes and didn't recognize the benefits that Joseph brought. This man dealt treacherously with our people and oppressed our forefathers, making them expose their babies so that they might not live. So the babies were being killed. Uh, at this time, Moses was born and was well-pleasing to God. Now, let's see what this note says. Hebrews 11.23. I don't remember what that says, but I don't think uh, I don't think Moses was particularly beautiful baby, and that's what impressed God and made God want to use Moses. I believe God formed Moses in the womb and had a purpose for him before he was even born. 
So you could read this from in from a perspective as if to think that Moses did something as an infant to impress God, and that's why God chose Moses to do it. But that really doesn't make any sense to me. I believe God formed Moses before he was even born and had a purpose for him before he was born. And when it says that Moses was well-pleasing to God as an infant, what possibly could an infant do to please God? God created the infant. God gave it life. Uh, God's completely responsible for who Moses was and what he, everything he had done up to that hit point, which was almost nothing because he was a newborn baby. Uh, so it would be hard to make a case that Moses did anything to impress God or that he was pleasing to God. In fact, I think we could use this verse to make the exact opposite point. Uh, that Moses didn't do anything to please God, but he was chosen by God before he was born to serve the purpose that God had planned for him. And he was brought up in his father's house for three months, but when he was set out, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and brought him up as her own son from the time he was three months old. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. And I think that's interesting. So, uh, you know, because when God comes to Moses, Moses wants to claim to not be able to speak or not be able to have any wisdom or anything. And But I guess when you're standing in the presence of God, it's uh, totally different than when you're compared to other humans. So compared to other humans, Moses was very mighty in words and deeds. But in the presence of God, he was utterly and completely worthless uh, and unskilled in every way. And that makes sense to me. Now, when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. So, when it says it came into his heart, do you think it came into his heart without any intervention or uh, opening of mind by God? Certainly not. Uh, God, especially, it's especially interesting that Moses' life is broken up to three 40-year periods. For the first 40 years, he was an Egyptian uh, prince. For the next 40 years, he was a, a wandering farmer in a far-off, unknown land, getting married and having children. And then for the last 40 years of his life, he is God's uh, Jewish deliverer out of Egyptian bondage and uh, into the land of promise. So it's 120 years, evenly broken up into three 40-year periods. Uh, and these things, I don't think it's a coincidence that at exactly 40 years, uh, what it came into his heart to visit the Jews. I think God put it on his heart. God opened his mind. God made him realize that he was a Jew himself. Uh, so God, who gives wisdom and understanding, opened up his heart when he was 40 years old. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptian. That means he killed him. So he killed an Egyptian in defense of a Jewish slave. For he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand, but they did not understand. So perspective is everything. Uh, and, you know, this is why Jesus said he spoke in parables. He says, for some it is given to understand, but to others it is not. And that's God's will. God does not want to uh Reveal the truth to some people for whatever reason that God has is justified and right. Um, and this Jew who rejected Moses, I, we're going to get to the story in just a second, so I guess I won't get ahead of myself. But Moses thought that, that the Jews would understand that God would use Moses to deliver them, but they didn't understand it. And the next day he appeared to two of them, two Jews, who were also slaves, as they were fighting amongst each other and tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brethren. Why do you wrong one another? But he who did his neighbor wrong pushed Moses away, saying, 
Who made you ruler and judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you did the Egyptian yesterday? Then at this saying, Moses fled and became a dweller in the land of Midian, where he had two sons. So Midian, I think, is well established that it is completely uh, over the two seas holding me. Look up a map. All right, so, you know, the Red Sea has two fingers that uh, split and create the Sinai Peninsula, uh, I believe is what it's called. You've got the Gulf of Suez, which is closer to Egypt, and then the Gulf of Aqaba, which is east, uh, I guess the eastern border of the Sinai Peninsula. Uh, but the land of Midian is past, is even east of the Gulf of Aqaba. So the Red Sea, the, the point I'm making is that I have grew up thinking that the Red Sea, that they, the part of the Red Sea that the Jews crossed over was the Gulf of Suez. Uh, but there is, I think, overwhelming evidence that the part of the Red Sea where they actually crossed was the Gulf of Aqaba, and when they got to the other side, that was the land of Midian, which is the place where Moses had been living for 40 years. So essentially, Moses led them uh, out of Egypt to his home where his wife and kids were. Uh, and when they crossed the Red Sea, it was the Gulf of Aqaba that they crossed, which also means the actual Mount of Sinai, where the law was given and all that stuff happened, uh, is also in the land of Midian. That's where the burning bush was. So I think there's a lot of... If you don't know... Uh... Oh, man. Hold on. This guy's dead now. His name is Ron Wyatt. Uh, there's actually a museum in Tennessee, in Middle Tennessee. Uh, I've driven past it and stopped to go in, but it was closed. Uh, it's a tiny little gas station. Uh, but Ron Wyatt has done a bunch of uh, archaeological stuff to support this. But anyway, it's something you can look into. Look into Ron Wyatt archaeology. You can learn some stuff that he's has done in his lifetime, but he's dead now. Uh, but anyway, just getting our location and bearings there, uh, I think verse 29, uh, Moses fled and became a dweller in the land of Midian where he had two sons. And when 40 years had passed, so he spent 40 years in Midian, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in a bush in the wilderness of Mount Sinai. So you see, Mount Sinai is where the law was given. After Moses goes back and brings the people out, he goes back to Mount Sinai. And this is also uh, where the burning bush was. I don't know if it was exactly the same place or close to the same place. It just says the wilderness of Mount Sinai. When Moses saw the burning bush, he marveled at the sight. And as he drew near to observe, the voice of the Lord came to him saying, I am the God of your fathers the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Moses trembled and dared not look. So this is the same Moses that was mighty in word and whatever it said, wisdom or something. 
uh, a few verses before, now Moses is trembling and dared not look. Then the Lord said to him, Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. And, you know, I imagine this is just a desert, a barren wasteland. Uh, and I don't think this land was holy before this moment. Uh, I believe the simple fact that this is the place where God spoke to Moses, that's what made it holy. Uh, it's not that the dirt was holy in that particular spot, but not holy somewhere else. I think it was holy simply because he was standing in, in closer proximity to the voice and presence of God than anyone had ever done before. So that's what made the land holy. Uh, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their groaning and have come down to deliver them. So God says, I have come down to deliver them. So that's that's a coming of the Lord, right? Uh, so whenever Moses goes back into Egypt and goes through the ten plagues and the, the miracles that go along with that, um... It's not actually Moses who does it, but it's God who had come down to deliver them. And God is using Moses as a mouthpiece or a figurehead uh, to do it. And now come, I will send you to Egypt. So again, this was precisely 40 years after he had left, he's going back. So a lot of things have changed in 40 years. Uh, But Moses' life is evenly split up into 40-year segments. And obviously this time, God appeared to him like on his 40th birthday or whatever uh, and said, now is the time I'm going to use you for the specific purpose that I created you for. This Moses whom they rejected, saying, Who made you ruler and judge is the one God sent to be ruler and deliverer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. Oh. Uh, now, it's, it calls him the angel who appeared in the bush. What did it say up here earlier? It says the Lord. Hmm. No, this doesn't say it's an angel. Uh, this says, well, it does too. Verse 30. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in flame of fire in a bush. But what the angel said is, I am the God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So, it's a little confusing, right? So, we say the only angel. Well, I, I don't think there is an angel who could say, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, because I don't think Jesus is an angel. It could be Jesus that did it. This could be a coming of Jesus uh, to earth for deliverance of the uh, Jews from Egypt. But I think angel would probably be better translated as spiritual being or something like that. Not like we we assign angel like a, a hierarchy. And there are scriptural reasons to do that. But anyway, that's just a little confusing point that we could discuss. Uh, what verse did I get to? All right, here we go. So it says, this Mo Moses whom they rejected. So Moses is a type of... Jesus, a type of Messiah, which means he is a foreshadowing for Jesus. He is a symbol of Jesus, someone who uh, come in the likeness of Jesus. Uh, so Moses, in many ways, uh, had many close uh, resemblances to Jesus, to Jesus coming to earth, to Jesus bringing redemption and deliverance, but and even being rejected because uh, the reason Moses left Egypt was because the Jews rejected him as their uh, deliverer. Uh, and the Jews rejected Jesus also as, as their Messiah. So, thirty-six, he brought them out after he had shown wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. Hmm. So I, I, it crossed my mind that these wonders and signs in Egypt were not just for Pharaoh, but uh, to convince Pharaoh to let them go, but they were also uh, miracles and signs and wonders specifically for the purpose of convincing 
the Jews that Moses was a man of God. So those miracles didn't just change Pharaoh's mind, they changed the Jews' minds also. This is that Moses who said to the children of Israel, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. So if you were doubting uh, my explanation of Moses being a type of Jesus, then uh, you couldn't doubt anymore after verse 37. Because Moses himself said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. He's talking about Jesus. Him you shall hear. Oh, I believe there's a scriptural reference. Deuteronomy 18, you can read about that. This is he who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers. What? So he's talking about Jesus. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me, which is Jesus. Him you shall hear, which is Jesus. You should hear Jesus. This is he who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai. So this is the same person, Jesus, who was in that burning bush on Mount Sinai who spoke to Moses with our fathers and who received the living oracles to give to us whom our fathers would not obey but rejected. And in their hearts they turned back to Egypt, saying to Aaron, Make us gods to go there before us. As for this Moses who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we did not know what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days, offered sacrifices to the idol, and rejoiced in the work of their own hands. I think that is one of the key problems with humans in general, is people would rather rejoice in the work of their own hands than give glory to God uh, for all things. People would rather make a cow out of melted gold earrings and things like that and praise and worship it as God, not because they think that's God, but because they are proud of themselves for making something, uh, I guess, to give glory to themselves. And right now, the thing that comes to my mind is the insistence for people to believe and glorify the human free will, I believe is a golden calf. Uh, because people trust in themselves. They say, well, how can I know that I'm saved unless I do certain things, and if I choose to do good, then I'm saved, and if I choose to do bad, then I'm lost. Uh, they can't trust in a sovereign God who chooses who he wants to save and bless and give grace to because they have absolutely no control over that situation. They don't like it. It's uncomfortable. It's like Moses spending too much time on the mountain. They say, I don't know where he is. I don't know if he's dead. I don't know if he's coming back. Uh, so we might as well do something that we can trust in ourselves. Uh, so let's trust in our human free will. Let's say, we're saved because of what I think and because of what I do and the decisions that I make. That's a golden calf. I hope it makes a little bit of sense to you uh, how trusting in the sovereignty of God is faith. That's what God intends for us to do. The reason Moses was even up on the mountain for such a long time was for the sole purpose of uh, creating doubt, an opportunity for doubt in the minds of those who were down waiting for Moses to come back. So what are you going to do when your faith is shaken, when you have an opportunity to uh, wonder what God has planned for you? Will you trust in yourself? Will you trust in your free will, your free moral agency? Or will you trust in the sovereignty of God? It's totally different. Okay, so that's, I guess, my soapbox. But they rejoiced in the works of their own hands. They loved that golden cow. Not because they thought God was a cow, but because they could see something and touch something and, and trust in themselves. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets. Did you offer me, Amos 5, did you offer me slaughtered animals and sacrifices during 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You also took up the tabernacle of Moloch 
and the star of your God, Repham, uh, images which you made to worship, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. So it's just the failure of the Jews, uh, which it makes, you know, Stephen makes the point <laughs> later that the Jews continuously rejected uh, the truth and the, what God had told them to do. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness. That's the actual tabernacle, the temporary temple that moved throughout the wilderness. As he appointed, instructed Moses to make it according to the pattern that he had seen, which our fathers, having received it in turn, also brought with Joshua into the land possessed by the Gentiles. That's Canaan or Israel whom God drove out before the face of our fathers until the days of David. So Joshua brought the people into Canaan. You had the conquest of Canaan where the Jews defeated all their enemies, took over the land, and the, t the tabernacle was with them uh, all the way up, even in the land of Egypt, until David, when David decided he wanted to build a house, a permanent house of God. Verse 46, who found favor before God and asked to find a dwelling for the God of Jacob. But Solomon built him a house because David was a man of war and he killed a bunch of people and God didn't want a, a warrior building his house. Uh, well, and, and I, I kind of hate to call it a house, but that's what it's called because God doesn't live in houses made with hands. But anyway, but Solomon built him a house. However, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands, as the prophet says. Now, I think this is, this might be offensive to the Jews. Um, with Stephen, everything he said so far is just a historical record that they would have agreed with. Um, and they should have agreed with this, but I don't know if they did. Because it was a house of God, but Stephen says that house cannot hold God. Uh, it's just a representative of something else. It's not the real thing. It's only a representative, a model. Uh, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands, as the prophet says. And Isaiah 66, Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Has my hand not made all things? So... That's the sovereignty and majesty of God. He does not live in a house that you can build for him. So it could have even been offensive that David wanted to build a house where God could live, as if God couldn't build his own house, or as if God didn't have a house already, or something like that, that God was homeless. 51, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit, as your fathers did, so do you. Now, I'm certain at this point, Stephen is making some people mad. Uh, so he might have made them mad when he said, God doesn't live in that temple that you hold so highly and you think is so fabulous. It's the center of your world and everything. You think God lives in a little house? He says, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. So the Holy Spirit was active even in the Old Covenant and the, their ancestors had resisted the Holy Spirit back then too. It's not like the Holy Spirit just showed up in the first century. He's always been around, always been active. Um, and he, Stephen says he's always been resisted also. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers who have received the law by the direct by the direction of angels and have not kept it. Whoo, boy. That's a harsh rebuke right to their face, right in front of everybody. So he starts out saying, hey, I'm a Jew just like you. I believe all the things that, that uh, are mentioned in the Torah in our historical record of the Jews. Uh, I am a Jew. I believe all these things. But you killed the Messiah that was promised and you continuously... Uh, reject God's prophets uh, and even the Messiah himself. You killed him. So when they heard this, these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed at him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, 
which means he was able to focus on spiritual things instead of earthly things because if he was focused on earthly things, he would be thinking about all the pain and agony he was about to endure physically. But I feel like God took him out of his physical body at this time, maybe so that he wouldn't even feel the pain that he was about to feel. But God gave him comfort. You know, it says at some point when, uh, I think when Jesus was on the cross or in agony or something like that, uh, it says that an angel was sent to comfort him. So I like to think about even my future death, whether I'm dying a car wreck or of old age or I fall asleep one night and never wake up or if someone kidnaps me and cuts my arms off and does something horrible to me, something like that. I believe that I could be filled with the Holy Spirit at the moment of my death and not endure all that pain and agony. You can look at all the horrible things that happen on earth and even the things that happen to Christians being tortured and tormented. Uh, and I know that God is able to get us through those hard times. Uh, and it says here that Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit. He gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing, not sitting, but standing at the right hand of God and said, Look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. What kind of comfort would that be? What kind of comfort? Uh, an unbelievable comfort to have a realization, to see with your eyes that the things that you had faith in uh, are true and accurate, and you're about to be fully engaged in the things that you had been hoping for uh, then they cried out with a loud voice, stopping their ears, and ran at him with one accord. They cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. So here's the first mention of Saul, which is Paul. And I at least see the possibility that both Luke and Acts were written by Luke, which was a travel companion of Paul. And one possibility is that Luke is writing these things as a defense for Paul. He told who Jesus was and what Jesus did, which is who Paul believed in and who Paul preached about. And now what well, we're in Acts chapter 7 and we've got to uh, the introduction of Saul of Tarsus who becomes Paul, uh, saying that it says... Uh, says the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of the young man named Saul. So I wonder if it was more than just Stephen. Maybe it was multiple people and Stephen was the one that was actually uh, doing the talking. But it says their clothes as if to say multiple people, not just Stephen, died and they laid the clothes at Saul's feet. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. So again, Stephen is focused on spiritual things. He's not focusing on this rock that's about to hit him in the head or these rocks that have been hitting uh, all over. I think he was able to focus on spiritual things, which made the torment and agony and physical pain maybe even uh, unrecognizable. Maybe he didn't realize what it was. Maybe God had essentially uh, already taken him. Uh, but he says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit, which is the same thing Jesus said on the cross. Then he knelt down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin, which is also what Jesus said on the cross. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. I don't think he went to sleep at all. Uh, I think it's just a phrase used to explain death. He died. Uh, but at this point, we've already had the resurrection of Jesus We've had the defeat of Hades and death. Uh, so, now I know uh, my buddy I watched, Don Preston, uh, would probably contend that the actual resurrection had not happened yet because I think you kind of have to tie 
the resurrection with the uh, parousia, which probably didn't happen until 70 AD. Uh, but I don't know. It's, it's kind of a, an awkward period in between 30 AD and 70 AD. You know, what happened to the dead bodies at that time? Uh, did they go to Hades? Was Hades completely destroyed yet? I feel like it was. I feel like Hades was destroyed. It was completely out of business. You couldn't go to Hades anymore. Uh, so if you don't go to Hades, where do you go? You go straight to heaven or hell. Uh, and I believe that's what the resurrection is. The resurrection, I don't, and I may be wrong about that. The resurrection might not be uh, the moment that our spirit is resurrected at the instant Spontaneous moment that our physical life expires but that's the way I view it right now so anyway something something to think about uh, that completes the stoning of Stephen and the historical record of the Jews in Acts chapter 7